Welcome back. I'm here with Chris DiGiorgio. He is an independent uh, strategic advisor and uh, formerly with the company Accenture and uh, had, had a particular specialty in the venture capital community. So, Chris, welcome to today's show. Very great. Very pleased to be here. So, uh, Chris, share some background uh, with us, uh, you know, the pathway that you walked in life and uh, how you got to where you are today. Oh, well, great. Well, sure. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, you know, my story, I could go on for a while, but I'll give you the short version of that. I was uh, born and raised in the East Coast, but came out here to California. And I'm one of those uh, public school kids from, you know, K through 12, through uh, college, uh, junior college at Solano College in Fairfield, and all the way up to uh, Cal State University at Chico in the computer science department there. So public school all the way in California. And then I uh, graduated in the early 80s with a combined degree in computer science and business, which was a bit unusual at the time. Most computer science degrees at the time were engineering related. Uh, and took a lark and, uh, and interviewed with an accounting firm. And so they were just starting to add computer science type people to the accounting practice and both for audits but also for consulting work and so I uh, came in the door at what was then uh, Anderson Consulting when we had about 3,000 people worldwide in 1981 and then uh, when I retired just a few months ago we had uh, about 280,000 people in Accenture so uh, I uh, enjoyed that wild ride the whole time that was I always thought that I would be changing jobs every two years, and it turned out that I was changing roles every couple of years, but always stayed with the same job. And you were at what position were you at Accenture? Uh, at the end, I was, I, for the last uh, six or seven years, I've been the managing director for uh, Accenture's business here in Northern California. So, um, you know, how do, you know, when you're managing director, what was your relationship to the clients? Were you working with little clients, big clients? What was your... Yeah, I guess we worked with a lot of clients. Our, most of our market is for the large global companies, the uh, G2000, as we would say. Uh, but around the valley here, you know, they can always tell who's the small company, who's going to be the big company in a couple of years. Uh, so part of my job was what I would call strategic account development. You know, when we have clients, we have them for many years. Uh, but we try, when we try and get new ones, it takes a while to do that. So in the last five or six years, my job was to work with new clients, clients that we had been pursuing for many years and uh, to try and essentially open those accounts up for Accenture. You know, uh, Accenture has played a major role in uh, helping little companies to become big. Right. And, uh, you know, when you're, when you're right here in the heart of Silicon Valley, 50% yeah. of the venture money in the world is right here. That's right. So you played a key component. So if we talk about, uh, if we talk about the evolution of companies, um, you know, is there is there a set formula that, that you've been able to identify why companies some companies succeed and why others don't? Well, it's a great question. I don't sure I have the exact answer to that. Otherwise, I would be out making some bets uh, on some future companies. But you can certainly look back over several decades and see some patterns. And really, what we see is uh, uh, venture backed companies tend to do better than ones that aren't venture backed, which is fine. You get the expertise of a venture capitalist. We could talk more about that later. Uh, companies that have a, 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 a mission to remain independent and on their own uh, tend to do better. Uh, otherwise, their assets get acquired by another company and the, you know, the entrepreneur gets recycled into the next uh, venture. Uh, one of the interesting statistics we did on our research on venture capital is that a full 92% of the jobs in a company are created after the IPO. 92%. So that's, 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 a, that's, that's a big a stunning statistic. number, yeah. Right, right. So when you look at the, across the valley at all the biggest companies you know, that came out, they were once small companies like Cisco was a small company at one point, Oracle was even a small company at one point. The IPO is the seminal event that helps them be a sustainable long-term enterprise and really create the thousands of jobs that we see in the valley. So uh, the IPO is important. Uh, a venture back you know, counselor and a coach along the way is important. And it helps to have a good idea, of course. So do you have some tips to, to foster for uh, aspiring entrepreneurs? Now, the tips, I would say, uh, right now there's a big buzz around consumer IT, you know, all the stuff that with app phone, apps on the uh, iPhone and Android and uh, things that are quick to market. Uh, those are very good. You can you know, certainly make some money in the short run. The, uh, the thing I look at is what's important for the Silicon Valley overall. And then we tend to see things that are much more enterprise related and have lasting uh, value uh, beyond just the isn't this neat app type thing. So look for the big idea that has a lasting enterprise to it, not, not just a, uh, a nifty. And a lot of people talk about disruption. There's many, many industries that can are ripe for disruption uh, and uh, find those that, where there's a big gap and a big discontinuity and fill that gap. 
I'm busy here today with Chris DiGiorgio. He is uh, formerly uh, the head of the Northern California uh, uh, Division for uh, Accenture uh, Consulting, and now he's an independent strategic advisor. Um, Chris, we need to take a quick break, sure. um, and I'd like to come back talk more about venture capital sure. world and uh, your experience that you gained over the years uh, with your role in Accenture. We'll be right back after these messages. I love fishing, you know, with my family. I think it would be easier to use a net. It was so much fun. The times when we are together, it makes it all, all the more worth it. Having Dad teach them how to, like, cast a fly rod and... As long as we're doing stuff together, we're having fun. Some people see a father and a son fishing together, while others see a succession plan. Welcome back. I'm visiting with Chris DiGiorgio. He is uh, formerly with Accenture Consulting over the Northern California area and uh, now a strategic advisor. And uh, Chris, we were talking about venture capital before. Why, why did Accenture choose to focus in the venture capital world? Yeah, it's a good question. I, uh, it was uh, partially planned and partially uh, you know, serendipity. So the planned part was we were looking into a number of research uh, areas. So we have a group called the Accenture Institute for High Performance, which is a bunch of researchers doing work for business periodicals, as you would expect, Harvard Business Review and other types. Uh, and we were studying the culture of Silicon Valley, the unique culture of Silicon Valley. And when we got into it, we were primarily looking at the differences of tech workers here versus the rest of the country. But what became apparent was, in the middle of that, uh, that there's something else that goes through the valley that's very different, and that is the impact that venture capital really drives in these companies and creates some of the, the behaviors of the tech workers. Uh, so at the same time, I was sitting in my office one day, and it pays to answer the phone, a, a random phone call from someone I didn't know. And it was a, a fellow parent at my kid's school who happened to be a, a venture capitalist and also the head of the Natural Venture Capital Association that year. So he was the chair of the NVCA. And he said, you know, we think the venture capital is at a crossroads and we'd like to do a, some focus groups around the country on the state of the venture capital industry with all the leading venture capitalists and some academics and some others. So he said, do you know anybody who would want to come help facilitate that program? So I raised my own hand. I said, that sounds interesting. I'll do it. And so out of that became, uh, I spent the next few months embedded with the venture capital community and really learning what was going on and feeling the pressures that they feel. But I also got a much better appreciation for what they've already done and what the, uh, the impact of venture capital has done for Silicon Valley. And that sort of wrapped the whole thing up into the study uh, we recently released. You know, if venture capital falters, will job creation decline? Yeah, that was the, uh, that's the thesis. Uh, and what we were noticing was two points. One is that uh, over the last three decades, venture capital is a very efficient uh, investment model for creating lasting enterprises. So the, uh, it's a half a percent of GDP or something like that, and yet there are 12 or 13 percent of private sector jobs. So think about that. Half a percent of the investment and a huge percentage of the success rate. So even though many of their ventures fail, the ones that go really are big generators. The second thing I, we found out was that not only are they great wealth returners to those who are investing, what we normally think of venture capital is where you make a big 20 times your, your money back, but they also bring the innovations that we all like. The, all the consumer products we have, a lot of the health products that we have, a lot of the uh, communications tools we use are all came from venture-backed companies. And then the third big piece of it is they create jobs for the rest of us. So even though these venture jobs create tech workers, highly skilled tech worker jobs by the thousands, uh, one of the recent studies that we looked at from the Bay Area Council Economic Institute says that a tech job generates four and a half other jobs in the local community for each tech job created. Now that compares to about one and a half for a manufacturing job. So a tech worker employs about three other, uh, three, three more people than a manufacturing job. So you put that all together and you say, okay, now I get it. All the venture capital is here, half of it. They generate the biggest enterprises for tech workers and those tech workers generate thousands and thousands of jobs for everybody else who live in this community. Pretty important. So what needs to change or, uh, to basically keep job creation flowing? Yeah, uh, it's a good question, and I think it's a complex one, but I'll try and take a short uh, stab at it. The uh, uh, venture capital has been the main game in town if you wanted to start 
an enterprise. And don't remember, if you're two, two guys and, and a dog, as we say, in a coffee shop with an idea, and you go to a bank and try and get money for that, you're not likely to be successful. Uh, you may find some friends who will back you in the beginning, but once you need real money, the, really the only place in the past to go to was the venture capitalists. But today, there's some new options out there. Angels have become much more imp uh, impactful, so their angel funds are quite large. And in fact, many companies will start with angel funding before they go to the venture capitalist. And then most recently, we've seen with the Jobs Act, the crowdfunding model has allowed the average American citizen to put some money into a, a startup enterprise. So those are all on the front end. Those are all competing with the venture capitalist who likes to get in early with a smaller investment let's say $2 million to get 20% of the company. Now they're being delayed in that cycle and they're coming in having to pay more money for a lower position in the company. And that makes changes the economics of, of the whole venture back. That's on the front end. There's a whole other story on the back end. I'm basing here today with Chris DiGiorgio. He was formerly a head of uh, Accenture Consulting over the Northern California division. And uh, Chris, we need to take a quick break sure. and we'll be right back after these messages. With current laws, we have left our children an enormous financial burden. Even though they may be too young to understand it. At GroCo, we care about you and the ones you love and the quality of your and their lives. Call us today to see how we can help. 877-CPA-2006. GroCo, helping you Welcome back. I'm visiting with Chris DiGiorgio. He is the uh, formerly with Accenture Consulting over the Northern California offices and uh, now is independent strategic consultant. Um, we were talking about the venture capital industry yep. before the break. Is it, is it the right size, too big, too small? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, it has varied greatly over the last uh, you know, 30 or 40 years from where the industry really started. Uh, it was pretty small for a long time, just a hundred or so firms uh, up until the 80s and then the mid 90s. And then, of course, the internet boom really got everybody going and uh, more than doubled the size of it. Uh, so, where there would in the past, there would be maybe five or eight billion a year going into venture capital. Uh, by the height of the dot com boom, a hundred billion dollars was being invested in venture capital. Now, that is way too much money to be wisely spent uh, a million or two at a time. And on top of that, it spawned about a thousand total uh, venture firms. That's also too many. There just isn't that much talent and good ideas. So over the last 10 years, 12 years since the end of the dot-com era, we've seen that number come back down to about 500 or so registered firms these days and about a $20 billion a year uh, investment size. So that's the size we're at today. But the reality is uh, it's not disproportionate. So a small number of those venture firms really do most of the new investing. In fact, last year of those 500 firms, about 100 of them made a new investment. 400 basically. 20 percent. 20 percent. That's it. Made new investments in new A rounds last year. The others were managing what they already invested in and saving their money for down rounds. Or the other big challenge is they still got a hangover or an overhang, depends on how you look at it, from the dot-com era where they've got investments now that were 10, 12, 15 years out that they can't uh, they can't IPO, uh, they haven't found a valid buyer yet, but they're viable enterprises, so they don't want to shut them down. So they've got the average funds now, 70% of funds are more than 13 years old. And these are funds that were planned to be eight years old. So we've got a number of dynamics going on here that would tell us that a smaller, focused, skilled venture industry is probably the best thing going. Some people call it a guild. You know, a guild of the size of around $20 billion in new investment you know, probably a few hundred uh, firms with the right skill set is the right idea, but that's about what we can handle uh, and be viable. Uh, so that's, that's, I think that's where we're headed. Does innovation promote venture capital or does venture capital promote innovation? You know, I think the history would say the chicken and the egg here starts with the innovation. The, uh, and one of the seminal moments in the history of the Valley was, the, uh, was Stanford after World War II really changing the model for innovation at the research level. So the uh, uh, Fred Terman and his uh, other professors really pushed students out with ideas to start enterprises versus staying in school and being academic. So Hewlett and Packard left, obviously, and, and changed history. And so that innovation cycle started. What followed after that was people really wanting to back that early on 
and a venture capital model uh, to to both help you know uh, ensure the success of that company, but also to re uh, share in the success of it financially. So I would say innovation leads, but venture capital makes it happen. You know, in in the world today, you see the emergence of the the angel funders or the crowdfunding becoming more uh, prevalent out there. And yeah. uh, what impact are they playing into the venture capital community? Yeah, that's a big impact. I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but let me take a little more deep dive into it. Angels have been around for a long time. Uh, you know, Lawrence Rockefeller and the Rockefeller Fund was an angel back in the 60s and start, helped start Eastern Airlines and things like that. So it's not new. What is new is the number of them and the amount of money they have. And, and they're really more people who have made their money in their first big shot. Uh, so alumni from places like uh, Google, uh, Facebook, and uh, other major uh, investors that have made their money are now becoming angels themselves. Uh, so that is an impact. Uh, it's helpful because a lot of good ideas can get started. You know, 20,000 new ideas get funded at the very angel level every year. 20,000, that's a lot. But the reality is, two years later, only 10% of them are going to able to get industrial funding, meaning uh, funding from a, a venture capitalist or a corporate fund or someone serious. So 90% cycle back. So angels help get a lot of new ideas to the table, but it's still just as hard to start climbing that mountain. Now, crowdfunding is brand new. Uh, it's, uh, it just came from the Job Act. It has just started. We'll have to see how this plays out. Uh, it allows anybody, qualif uh, qualified investor or not, to make an investment up to a million dollars in a uh, in a startup. The unknown is how uh, the rank and file public is going to take the fact that almost guaranteed you're going to lose your money. On a rare occasion, you'll make your money back. Most likely, you're going to lose all your money. And so, as we said in a, in a seminar recently, uh, it's hard to see how this ends well, uh, because the uh, the eventuality is that most of these investors who invest in these companies are going to lose what they invested. You know, th th there seems to be a pattern though with the uh, the whole industry that uh, eighty percent of the, the the money is coming from uh, uh, you know, or eighty percent of the deals come from twenty percent of the the venture firms. Right. And then likewise, uh, these guys are able to consistently do deal after deal after deal. And uh, you know, the, find the success there. Yeah. Uh, what is it? What, what differentiates those those who are making it versus those who are not? Excellent question. And I would say, uh, I'm a recent uh, uh, expert in venture capital, but as I look back at the history, you know, ten firms last year got half of all new money invested in venture capitalists. That's pretty constant, considering you know, uh, almost 200 firms took in new money. Half of that money went to just ten. What's interesting is that some of those 10 are the same ones you see for the last 10 and 20 years, but some of them are new. Yeah, they're not the ones that were there five or eight years ago. So we're, there is a little bit of churn at the top 10, and it's not obvious who the biggest ones are, but they, we know who they are today, but they may not be the ones who were there seven years ago or seven years from now in these kind of cycles. Uh, so what's, what's really, though, has come up is that there is a, uh, the firms that are successful today are taking a broader view of the funding cycle from working with very small companies, but also being what's called growth equity, coming in mid-cycle in round B or C of an, of an entity and then bringing their venture capital talent and funds in at that late level. That was not a model that was common a few years ago. Uh, and then there's other areas that can, uh, other uh, services. Uh, one of the biggest challenges startups have, believe it or not, is hiring. You know, uh, there's a, if you go to the NVSA website at the bottom, there's a, a, a Sticker that says there's 10,000 open jobs now at venture firms. What can we do to close the gap? So the biggest venture firms are now talent agencies. They can help source engineers, salespeople, executives at the right levels to help these companies grow because there's a tremendous shortage of that talent in the area. So a combination of looking at the whole funding cycle, but also being a talent agency and a, and a, a coach for the long term is made for a successful model today. Chris, we need to take a quick break, and uh, this is all fascinating about the whole industry of venture capital. I'm visiting here today with uh, Chris, Chris DiGiorgio, and he's a strategic advisor in the venture capital area. It's been a, a, a very long career at Accenture, and um, we'll be right back after these messages. He's the world's most trustworthy man. Tax filing deadlines are scheduled around his vacation calendar. The IRS agent who audited his client apologized. I don't always advise people on their taxes, but when I do, I save them every penny legally possible. 
Groco CPAs and Advisors. Come to Groco and stay wealthy, my friend. Welcome back. I'm busy here today with Chris DiGiorgio. He is a strategic advisor, formerly with Accenture uh, over the Northern California um, area. And uh, we've been talking about venture capital today. Um, Chris, with the changes in the landscapes, uh, some people may feel that the venture capital are a victim of their own doing. I, what, what's, your, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, it's a good question. I think there is a certain extent that is true. I mean, the uh, they had the the industry. They they define their own practice. They're the uh, they're a bit of a guild. They act together, uh, but the reality is they've they've uh, gone to a more concentrated model now. That in a number of ways that has somewhat uh, caused some issues. Uh, as you may know, you know worldwide venture capital is worldwide, but eighty percent of it is still in the U.S. And in the U.S., some sixty percent of it is still in Silicon Valley. Tremendous concentration. Uh, of it here. And it doesn't mean it isn't good ideas here, but this is not the only place where there are good ideas and good entrepreneurs. So diversity would help. Uh, the other diversity angle is the uh, the segments they're choosing to invest in. They're feeling the pressure of returns, so they're drifting more towards short-term tactical uh, consumer tech and some other areas. And falling off the list of investments are biotech and green tech energies and these things that take longer and more capital intensive. So they're getting less attention than they used to. That's probably not very good. So what can really help with the, uh, the VC is to help uh, think of things more broadly and more diverse and look for entrepreneurs the way they used to. Some would call it a return to actual venturing versus investment management, what we see today. In fact, when we we'd interviewed a number of entrepreneurs, they could tell you that the best uh, venture capitalists are the ones that are the coaches for the life of their company. The worst ones are the ones that invest the money and just manage that as if they were an investment banker, and that's not what venture capital is about. You know, uh, Chris, when we look at the venture capitalists and their impact on society today, yeah. I appreciate your thoughts and you know where you know where, where this has brought us and where do you think it's going? Yeah, that got my my attention. I would say if there's one issue that came out of the uh, the project we did, uh, I'm pretty actively involved in the community. I'm the chair of the Tech Museum in San Jose, very involved in science and STEM. I'm also the chair of Joint Venture Silicon Valley with Mayor Reed of San Jose as well. So I spent a lot of time looking at the bigger picture of Silicon Valley. And what's, you know, what became obvious to me was, as I looked at the private sector employment in the Valley, man, a large portion of that came from what were at one time venture-backed companies. And if we're seeing a decline in those types of investments, what does that mean for the Valley overall five and 10 and 15 years down the road? Will there be the next Cisco coming down the pike? Or will they just be a number of consumer apps that come and go and generate wealth, but they don't generate sustainability? So I think what's been uh, most interesting to me is to see how we can help change, influence venture capital and entrepreneurs to think about the long-term enterprise, which not only benefits them, but it benefits you know, the rest of Silicon Valley with those four and a half extra jobs per person that I talked about last time. In venture capital, is smaller better? At this point, it looks like it is. I would say smaller is better. Uh, you have uh, what we would call patient limited partners or investors who are willing to wait the 10 or 12 years it takes to get a payout. Uh, and when you get larger, then you get impatient investors who force near-term actions, which are not, uh, not, not the best. Uh, and I think the, uh, you know, the evidence is that the number of entrepreneurs is held at about 1,000 a year. That's it. There's a, for the last 25 years, there's been 1,000 or 1,200 new entrepreneur startups that are quality every year. So if that's constant, it helps to have a constant flow of dollars attached to that. Chris, if someone wants to contact you for uh, more information, how would they go about that? Yeah, that's great. Uh, uh, happy to, to chat. My uh, I'm available on LinkedIn uh, and under Chris DiGiorgio. You can find myself there, uh, and that's probably the best way to, to contact me. I'm visiting here today with Chris DiGiorgio. He's a strategic advisor and uh, formerly with Accenture Consulting and uh, you know the great expertise in the venture world. And so we appreciate uh, all that they're uh, all that you present today. There, are there any final thoughts to bring up? Yeah, sure. We've talked about a number of things today. The report uh, we did is available at Accenture.com slash Silicon Valley. All one word. Accenture.com slash Silicon Valley. These reports are available for you to look at if you're interested. Thanks for joining us today here on America Dreams. Join us right here on AM 1220 KDOW next week.